بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So um, let me start by what happened after the last uh, Friday Night Lights we spoke about uh, the, well the title was Are We in the End of Days and perhaps today is the same title I don't know but a number of interesting things happened Number one, someone came to me after the Salah and informed me of a Mahdi that is alive and well today, okay? Now, but before that, he started by casting doubt on the Ahadith in general. And specifically, this is an old argument, it's nothing new. They tell you that the Mahdi, the Dajjal, they don't exist. Because all the hadith in mentioning the Mahdi and all the hadith mentioning, mentioning the Dajjal are not found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Uh, the Dajjal, there are some hadith in Sahih Muslim, but they tell you they're not in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. And, and then he's basically, the, you'll find them in Sunan Abi Dawood and Nasa'i, mentioned by Imam Ahmad, Rahimullah, and others. But that's one old argument, and that is to say that we can't rely on these hadith. Now, you say that first, then you say, I've got a Mahdi. Why do you have to say that first? Because when you get rid of the ahadith describing the Mahdi, now anybody can be the Mahdi. So I personally met a Mahdi in Florida. He is originally from Guyana. And I mentioned the Mahdi in my Jumu'ah khutbah, and he came up. Again, this is the Mahdi, and he's just some guy in the audience. He's not the khatib, he's not the leaders. He, he said, have you heard of so-and-so? I uh, said, uh, no, I never heard of him, said, because he also claims to be the Mahdi. And by the way, we know from the hadith that we mentioned last time, the Prophet said his name will match my name. So his name will be Muhammad. His father's name is Abdullah. That's the Mahdi. He's not like someone who was born, uh, you know, Hassan ibn Abdullah, and then he changed his name legally to Muhammad. No, he was born Muhammad. His father was born Abdullah. So, uh, but this guy's name was something starts with an N, last name starts with an I. And he's Guyanese. So I said, uh, where can I find him? He said, I am he. <laughs> and I'm dying to have fun with him. I'm just, mm, mm. But, but two things. One, like he's in his 50s. And two, nobody claims they're the Mahdi unless there's something wrong up here. So I didn't have fun with him. But I did ask him, I said, listen, you do know that the, the Mahdi is going to be from the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ. He's going to be Arab. He cut me off. He said, uh, yes, yes, those were the original plans. Then Allah saw that the Arabs were not worthy. So now, anybody can be the Mahdi. Anyone. When you weaken the hadith and you tell me, oh, because it's not in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, the scholars answer that. They said, there are many a hadith that are authentic that are in Sunan Abu Dawood and Muslim the Imam Ahmad and uh, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, and so on and so forth. And just, are we just limited to what's authentic in al-Bukhari, or about what's authentic in the other books? So, uh, so basically now when you're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed his mind, now anybody can be the Mahdi. So I'm trying to illustrate this to him. I said, okay, you claim to be the Mahdi. There was another brother with us. I said, and this brother claims to be the Mahdi. And I'm just a layman, an average Muslim. Now that the ahadith are all invalid, what mechanism do I have to be able to, to discern and to tell which one of you two is the Mahdi? You understand? That's why, like I said last week, the Prophet ﷺ gave us so many details about the Mahdi, his lineage, his physical description, and his travels, his movement from this place to that place, and the bay'ah and how it happens, and the army that gets swallowed up, and then everybody pledges to him, and you go, make sure you, sure you pledge to him, all that stuff. Then we have, when he leads the, the three, the battles, the first day, the second day, the third day, and in, the, in that Fajr prayer, right before they make the Aqama, right before he makes the Takbir, the Muslims look up and they see Isa alayhi salam coming down. And maybe we can talk about this later. But the point here is this. Then he's, he tells Isa alayhi salam, taqaddam ya ruh Allah. He asks him to advance and lead the prayer. 
And then the Isa alayhi salam pushes him. He said, the Iqama was made for you. And Isa alayhi salam prays behind him. And the Mahdi leads that Fajr. And then there is not a single hadith about the Mahdi. Nothing else. Absolutely nothing. Not even a fabricated hadith. Why? Because who cares? That's why. Yani when Isa alayhi salam, one of the five greatest prophets, returns, nobody cares about the Mahdi anymore. He did his job and he's done. You've got a superstar here. I always give the example, if I'm giving a lecture and then Mufti Mink walks in. Do you care about the rest of my lecture? Yeah, you, everyone's going to run to Mufti Mink. And when you get to him, you'll find that I'm ahead of you there also. Yeah? So that's why we have the description until that point because we need to know the description. So that when someone says, I'm the Mahdi, I can weigh them against these hadith and see if they're telling the truth or not. But when you get rid of the hadith, now we've got nothing. Anyone can be the Mahdi and there's no way to prove you're true or false. Okay. So anyways, that's, so the, the first thing is when, when the guy started like attacking the hadith, I told him, listen, it is just inconceivable and it's impossible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal the Qur'an and tell us to pray, and tell us to pay zakah, and tell us to do all these things. Then he'll put the instructions, the details in the sunnah. And then preserve the Qur'an and not preserve the sunnah. Yeah, do you really think that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan? But let me give you another uh, analogy here. Imagine you buy furniture from Ikea. And the outside of the box says, you need to assemble this yourself. And it's very complex. Okay? And then you open it, there are no instructions. But what's the value of telling me, assemble it, if you didn't give me the instructions of how to assemble it? What's the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling you hundreds of times in the Qur'an to establish the prayer, and then he doesn't preserve the other form or the other source, which is the sunnah, the hadith, that has how to pray. There are those, it's an old argument, that said that the Dajjal does not exist because the Prophet said in the hadith that there is no fitna that worse or more difficult than that of the Dajjal. There's never a test more difficult than the Dajjal. So they said it is, there's no way that the Dajjal is such a big deal and he's never mentioned in the Qur'an. And by the way, the scholars spoke about why he's not mentioned in the Qur'an. Number one, they said that he is the first one to say, I am Allah, not you should worship me, I am, your, I am your Lord who created you and the trees and everything like that. They said, even if Fir'aun said, Ana rabbukum al -a'la, he, even if he did mean, he didn't really mean I created that tree and I created the mountains, and he, they're saying he didn't say that. But even if he said that, the Dajjal had, has superpowers, for lack of a better term, that Allah Azza wa gave him, that makes it more convincing in his statement than Fir'aun. Fir'aun said, I'm ana rabbukum al-a'la, and he had lice, right? <laughs> you understand the wisdom be behind why Allah gave them lice? And can you imagine this guy sitting on his throne, he's like, ana rabbukum al-a'la. You understand why it's so appropriate that he got lice? <laughs> By, anyways, so they're saying that he makes this claim. He claims to be Allah Azza wa Jal, your creator. So, he, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even give him a negative mention in the Quran. He doesn't deserve it. And that's not a problem. Because the believers never say, why is this, in the Quran? Why is this uh, mentioned in the hadith but never in the Quran? Believers never say that. Because they accept both. If you accept both, what's the problem? It can be here or here or in both. But only people who have issues say, well, this is so important, it should have been in the Qur'an. That's because the sunnah is not important to you. If the sunnah had weight, you wouldn't ask that question or, or put that condition. So the Dajjal, the scholar said, yeah, he's not mentioned in the Qur'an. They said there is something far more important than the Dajjal and it's not mentioned in the Qur'an. The Dajjal affects... Muslims towards the very end of times or towards his time period, they're the ones who will be immediately affected by him. The ones before will not be, and the ones after, the generations after, will not be. But there's something that will affect every living Muslim in the history of the planet, 
and it's not mentioned in the Quran. They said the number of rak'at for Maghrib prayer. That's more important than the Dajjal. We need that practically every single day. Every believing man or woman and child needs it. It's not in the Quran. It's not a big deal. You know why? Because it's in the Sunnah. So don't ever accept from anyone who tries to say, well, you know, all the hadith are, are subject to and open to interpretation. No, they're not. Don't, don't play that game. But when you, what you're really trying to do is get rid of the hadith and then you can fool around with the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody can be the Mahdi and there's no way to prove or disprove. If you want me to finish that story, I said, okay, give me proof that he's the Mahdi. He said he has predictions that come true. And his next prediction is this winter, 2023. I said, what's the prediction? He said, that's in two months. He said, what's the prediction? He said, there will be no winter this year in the whole world. And the temperatures will rise to 151 degrees. That was like, this is great. It's only two months away. I don't need to waste any time debating here. I just said, let's make a deal. If this comes, if this is false, you forget about this guy forever. He said, deal, we shook on it. End of discussion. Khalas. And there's so many Mahdi's. There's a, a Mahdi who has a YouTube channel. And every video he uploads, he's like in his 30s or late 20s. Every video he uploads, he's de- refuting his 15-year-old cousin. Because his 15-year-old cousin doesn't believe he's the Mahdi. And he, every video he's addressing his cousin, why I am the Mahdi. And when the Mahdi comes, he's going to have bigger issues than a 15-year-old who doesn't believe in him. But... Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it so that everyone becomes uh, clearly aware that this is the man. And that's why people will pledge to him in numbers. It's not going to be some guy on YouTube or like the guy in Florida. 15 years, he said, he's been saying he's the Mahdi. He has just a few followers. I'm more worried about your followers. Right? I mean, you have a, a situation. That's why you think you're the Mahdi. Explain your eight followers. What's their deal? Anyways. Um, so, uh, so the other thing is one of the techniques, and maybe I should say, we really collectively as an ummah, we have the end of times akhlaq. We have the akhlaq of end of times when there is killing and this and that. We have those. We're ready. Go online. You find the Muslims are ready for it. They have the mannerisms of the end of times people, you know, and people are always, yes, please. You guys in the back, Shani, don't disrupt everyone else. So the pe- people are quick to discredit one another. And if you don't hear what you want to hear from a speaker, he must be a scholar of the dollar. He must be, uh, I don't know what, working for the West, or he must be a recipient of Saudi money. On that note, where is the Saudi money, by the way? Huh? <laughs> I had the, one of my, uh, my teachers, and he was at a lecture and this guy was saying some crazy things about Islam and some crazy deviant things. He said, I got up and I spoke against him and the whole audience was with me. He said, suddenly a guy got up. He said, I've never seen this guy before in my life. But he was able with one sentence to change the whole, change the whole tide against me. He said, everyone was on my side because this guy was saying crazy things. He said, then a guy stood up and said, I've seen him take money from the Saudis before. He said, immediately, everyone came to beat me up. Everybody, just, all you have to do is Saudi money. So I personally don't know any speaker who gets money from the Saudis. And apparently when Saudis give you money, they just give you cash in front of everybody. (laughs) This guy just saw him, okay? Anyways, but people, that's one of the ways you discredit people. And I, I have a khutbah right here on our YouTube channel. And one of the comments is like, yeah, go ahead, read from your little paper. I wrote it, I read from it, I wipe my nose, but look, what kind of comment is that? It's like, oh yeah, you're working for the West. You don't know me, and I don't have Saudi money. When I have Saudi, you'll know it. You'll see my watch. Inna alhamdulillah. But you know, the, this way, by the way, you, when you discredit everybody, everybody's a scholar for the dollar, everybody works for this, everyone uh, you know, is a, uh, works for the uh, government and all that. You discredit people. This is a technique that a lot of cults also and deviants use to make sure you don't go anywhere else. 
So you're not going to ask anybody else besides their guy because everyone else is something wrong with them. Everyone else is something, they have, so, they have something wrong with them. So um, going back to the signs of the hour, all right, we understand that some of the, some of the signs have been mentioned in great detail, minor and major. And some of the signs have purposely been left vague, all right? And some of the signs, even the Prophet ﷺ doesn't know the order. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the 10 major signs. And he mentioned the emergence of the beast from the earth, the dabba, and he mentions the sun rising from the west. And then look, he says, whichever comes first, the other will follow immediately. So here... Prophet doesn't know the order. He said, whichever of these two comes first, the other will follow it very quickly. So it's when they've been left vague, it is not our job to fill in the blanks. People think, oh, because it's vague, Baga, I can interpret however I feel like. La Habib. It's not your job to fill in the blank blanks. You actually have one job concerning the unseen. Just to believe. That's your minimal requirement is to believe in the signs. Not to explain it. Taib, explain the beast to me. Even though the beast is mentioned in the Quran, Allah Azza says, أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَّةً مِنْ الْأَرْضِ تُكَلِّمُهُمْ we, set, we, we brought you, or emerged a beast from out of the earth that speaks to them. Taib, this beast, what kind of animal is it? What is the language that it speaks? How many languages does it speak? Where is it located exactly? How did it eat when it was under the ground? Where did it learn language from if it was underground? I don't know the answers to that. It was left vague. You didn't notice that? It was left vague. So I don't have to explain it to you. And if I don't have explanation, it doesn't mean it's nonsense. Because my minimal requirement is to believe in it. Not to explain it. You're not going to explain the unseen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unseen. And the knowledge is with Allah azza wa jal. So it's not a green light to interpret as you wish. We showed last week how there can be one more, more than one plausible explanation. There are many examples of also uh, more than one manifestation of a sign. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, the hour will not be established المال, until wealth becomes abundant amongst you. Now, this sign, we can mention three different times, and you could possibly think of others, when it actually happened. And the scholars mention all three are possible. Yani it can happen more than once, especially the minor signs. The difference between minor and major, one of the differences is that minor signs can occur multiple times. Major signs occur once, which is a good thing. Because if they occur twice, if finally the jail is killed, another one comes. Allah, Taib Isa is not here. What, what are we going to do? So, يَكْثُرْ فِيكُمُ الْمَالِ The wealth, wealth will increase and become abundant. They said that happened at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was the Khalifa. Fikum, some scholars said it means amongst the companions. Others said for the Muslims. But the companions at the, at the death of Umar or by the time of Umar, uh, his Khilafah, they said there was so much wealth that the tariqa, whatever you leave for your inheritors, imagine you leave a little bit of gold, you give this guy a bit, this guy, they would have to break it with an axe. And imagine that much gold, that much silver, that you need an axe to break it up so that your inheritors can get their share. So they said at the time of Umar ibn Khattab that happened. During the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, that happened. And during the time of the Mahdi, the hadith are clear that that will happen. So these are three manifestations of the same sign. So there can be more than one plausible explanation. There can be more than one manifestation. The other thing is, um, if you don't comprehend a sign, don't deny it. Remember, we said the minimal requirement is you, you believe in it. That's it. I don't have to explain it. I can't even explain it. But... Sometimes it's due to the timeline. Like one com a comment from what I said last week about uh, after the three trials, the ummah will split into two camps, a camp of iman with no hypocrisy, a camp of hypocrisy with no iman. So someone said, how do you expect all these billions of Muslims to split into two camps? First of all, look at the timeline. This is far later on. After major trials, a lot of deaths. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. And nobody said they live within one perimeter. The whole ummah is in one camp and they're like, you, they check your badge. Oh, mu'min, okay, come. So no one said it's like that. But it separated the people, meaning demarcated the people. Wallahu a'lam. Um, 
there are other things that people use, uh, like the word science now is a word that's used to scare people. Like one, one guy was discussing the end of times with me. He tried to scare me by saying, uh, I'm a scientist and I know this. Type Habibi, you're robotics. We're talking about biology. You tell me the word scientist, I'm supposed to be afraid. He deals with uh, artificial intelligence, really, you know, AI. Type. And we're talking about biology, but you, you are a scientist, but not in this field. So people will say things like, and they will not even do a basic Google search. Yeah, that's what's painful. And they'll tell you, oh, this sign doesn't exist because of this, because we explored the earth. I don't know if I said this last week. There's one guy, he's an Arabic speaker, and he always pushes, like he, present, uh, he, he pushes himself as this scientific, science-based speaker. He says that the Dajjal doesn't exist because we have scoured the earth and we haven't found him. And I said, if you do a simple Google search, unexplored regions of the earth, so much of the earth has not been explored. And you just made that statement. Or they tell you that human beings cannot live without sunlight. Who said that? Who said that? Google it. Just basic Googling. Well, it's not even research. It's put in words and hit enter. Like human beings cannot live without Yajuj and Majuj. How can they be in a cave? First of all, nobody said the word cave, but they're trapped somewhere. Oh, but how would they live without sunlight? Who says that for, in order for you to be in a cave, there has to not be any sunlight? I always tell the story. I personally visited some caves in Malaysia, and it's basically a mountain. You're climbing up these stairs. You go inside this hollowed out mountain. Not human, but just hollow mountain. And if there's only one entrance, and if somebody blocked that entrance after we walked in, we would be stuck in there. But way up at the peak, the summit, kid, at the peak of the, the, the open, there's an opening and sunlight comes through it. There you go. We're stuck. We're in a cave or a hollowed out mountain. We can't get out. And there's sunlight. People, you, they just, they don't use their imagination enough to explain other possibilities, you know? Um... Now, another thing is that the signs of the Day of Judgment, they are to be taken literally. The majority of human speech is literal speech. The Qur'an, with ex an exception of few parts, Allah is speaking literally. And the Hadith, the same way. The signs, the same way. But we always, when we can't figure something out, we say, oh, it's just figurative, it's just figurative. Even most speech is, is literal to the point that we don't use the word literally accurately. Someone will tell you, it was so hot, I literally died. But if you literally died, I wouldn't have to hear this boring story of yours. Just kidding. Like, you wouldn't be here telling me this story. You mean figuratively. But let's, the, the sun will rise from the west. No, no, the sun rising from the west, somebody said this. The sun rising from the west is not actually the sun rising from the west. Why not? It said that. He said, what it means is that Islam will flourish in the western countries and that's how the sun will rise from the west. Okay, great. But why is it that the Prophet ﷺ said that when the sun rises from the west, Tawbah will not be accepted anymore. You can't repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. So like if a, th a million people become Muslim in America and, and, and Europe and what have you, you can't make Tawbah anymore? Why not? It doesn't make any sense. The sun rising from the west is a sign that is so major that it's too late to become a believer after it. Meaning you've seen something so indicative of the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal that it's too late for you. I'll give you an example. Every atheist in the history of the planet who said there's nothing out there, when the angel of death came to them at the time of death and they saw him, they said, oh, there is something out there. But can they become a believer at that point? Because now you've seen something from the unseen, something so, such a strong indication that it's too late to go back. So the sun rising from the west is a sign, it's such a major sign that everyone will know that this is a sign from Allah Azza wa and it's too late to make Tawbah after it rises from the... For that generation. For that generation. So, people becoming Muslim in the West, it doesn't match it at all. 
And why can't I make Tawbah after that? So th the problem is people always try to make it sound something like it's figurative. Nasser said, after 15 billion years, the sun will rise from the west. So the earth is slowing down, slowing down, it'll turn the other way, whatever explanation. But that's not a powerful explanation where you, you always see the sun come up from this window and tomorrow you wake up, it's from this window. That's major, not slowing down over 15 billion years. Okay. So these were just some of the guidelines. I think the guidelines are so important that I wanted to spend more time on just a few of them because the, the nonsense out there is, is immense. It's a lot, of, a lot of crazy things are being said. And because people don't know the guidelines, when you stick to the hadith, somebody says, oh, look, you're just restricted to, to the hadith. You know, give us your own. We said, I can give you my own, but I'm saying that this is possible and not the only definition. I said that the red flag is when someone tells you this is it and it's very precisely it will happen at this time, at this hour, at this place, and that anyone else who tells you anything else is wrong. Okay. طيب. So going, going to Palestine, are, is the liberation of Palestine, is it one of the signs of the, of the Day of Judgment, minor or major? And it's interesting. So you will find a group of scholars. They mention, the Prophet mentioned in this hadith, that the hour will not be established until you fight the Jews. So they said, then it makes Palestine from the minor signs of the hour. But the, uh, the, the majority, the other scholars, they said Palestine is not from the major nor from the minor signs of the hour. Because that hadith is speaking about when Isa alayhi salam returns. And it's a later time period. And as we expressed last week, that the uh, Al-Aqsa or Jerusalem or Palestine will already be liberated by the time the Mahdi comes. And we gave the arguments last time. So it's already under the control of the Muslims. So they're saying that it, it's neither mentioned in this way nor the other way, and it's not mentioned as one of the signs of the hour. Wallahu ta'ala ala. But the, the most important thing is this, is that, uh, and, and I mentioned the point last week about how it gives you more hope that it's not the Mahdi who's going to free Palestine. Because then you have to sit and there's nothing you can do. But the fact that it will happen before the Mahdi, that means we will be a part of it, meaning what we do today or what we do with our children or things that we initiate and things that they will do, they will be a part of the, the catalyst that leads to Palestine being free. So that's why doing your part is very important when people boycott. And, and what's very important also is to respect what the other person is doing. Yani there are some people who are involved politically on the issue of Palestine, and they have no respect for what the other person is doing. And there are people who make dua, and they look down at those who go to rallies, and rallies don't mean anything in America. So if someone is going to a rally, all right, even if you don't believe that's going to amount to anything, just leave them alone. If someone boycotts, leave them alone. And it's also part of good manners. You know, let me explain why. Uh, let me use the mask, the COVID mask analogy. If you gave me a study that shows that without, within, يعني, with absolutely no doubt, the mask is absolutely worthless piece of cloth you're putting on front of your face, I would still wear the mask. Why? Because the mask makes the uncle in the masjid feel comfortable when I wear it. He's afraid for his health. He's older. And he feels more comfortable when I wear it and I'm sitting next to him. I'll do it for him. See, not everything is about the individual. Not everything is about your opinion. Sometimes you do things for the community. Some people, and we have in our community, and I know everywhere around the world, there are people who just feel helpless and depressed. Some people are slipping into depression. They don't know what to do. Then they go to this rally and they yell and they scream and they chant and all this stuff. And they come back feeling like they've done something. Who am I to come and tell them, let me explain to you, what you just did for two hours, you did nothing but make your throat sore. You <laughs> see how cruel that is? And maybe that's their only outlet. So I'm not saying it's worthless. I'm saying if my opinion were that, was that 
rallies are worthless, I would still not take that away from people who want to go out and show their numbers and show their support and come home feeling better, right? And if people boycott, I won't try to give them evidence that boycott economically does not do anything. Yeah, hey, let them do something. And I will respect that. And, you know, some, some of you know, or most of you know, my wife is Palestinian. So I boycott whether it makes sense or not. Just kidding. I just boycott. My, my wife says we, we, I do. I boycott. So you're here in Lilish Man of old days, yeah, and you can't. So I boycott, right? And she told this story. She was uh, at an event and she was talking to this other sister. Uh, and they were both talking about how they boycott. And they were bonding over this idea of boycotting. So a sister was, a third sister joined them and she saw the discussion was about boycotting and they mentioned some products and they mentioned Coca-Cola. So the sister ran to the ice cooler, opened, the, uh, opened it, grabbed the Coke and then ran back to them and opened it in front of them, in the middle, get psst. Five wife, wives. Huh, you don't believe it, I don't believe it. I, but just whatever someone is involved in, and you, the truth is, you really don't know what, from all the things we're involved in, which one of them will be part of the things that will lead to the eventual uh, uh, any, uh, freedom of, of Palestine. You don't know. So people who are active politically, halas, let them do what they're doing. And they may not completely change the tide, but they might change some opinions that will lead to something happening in the future. That's just how it works. Boycotting, uh, rallies, Allow people to do these things and find what you can be a part of. And that's the thing, like we always say. And I always liken like da'wah and things where you're moving the ummah in a direction. Everybody is like one component in a machine. So da'wah is a machine and you're one of the pieces in it. And if you were to remove any metal piece from an engine, it would stop. Because it's all important, walaullah shaykh. Yeah, we have people who understand more than I do in mechanics. You know, when I was uh, a young teenager, yani, I used to have this moped. And I used to always take it apart. I would take the carburetor apart every day. I'd clean it, put it back together. And one day I felt confident. I took the pistons apart and I took the piston out. And there was this ridiculous dumb ring around the piston. As I was taking it out, it broke in half. And I remember saying, it's just a dumb ring. I put it back broken. It never ran again for two years. That's the piston ring has a very important part. So everything is important. There's no one component that it, if you could do without it, Mr. Honda wouldn't have put it in there. Everything has its part. So everyone plays a role. Now, with that being said, one of the things we should all do is have a stronger connection to our mas masajid. Like, what does that have to do with anything? And make sure your children have a strong connection to the masjid. And Wednesday, what are we going to do today? We're just going to go to the masjid. What are we going to do? We're just going to chill. There's nothing happening. We're just going to sit in the masjid. You're going to play your game, play it in the masjid. You're going to read, read in the masjid. And we're going to pray there. And we're going to attend classes. We're going to attend lectures. Why? What does that have to do with anything? Look at any of the victories in Islamic history and any of the things of the victories that are going to happen in the future. Who, who are the victorious ones? The believers. And the final end is for those who have taqwa. So the believers are the ones who will change things in the planet in the years to come. The believers are the ones who will get the victories. So make sure you and your children are from that group of the believers. I hope that what's happening is a big wake-up call for people to, to drop you know, bad habits, to, to stop you know, with their complaints and their, I hate this and I can't stand that. Because look at what's happening to people. People haven't had a meal, drinking sewer water for days. And here we are, oh, too much ice. And, oh. and by the way, th this, this aspect of raising children has, uh, is about extinct, basically. The idea of, you know, it making a, or... Yeah, and creating or raising men, warriors. This concept doesn't exist. Khalas, it's gone now. It's gone. But when you talk about it, people are like, well, what is this? Like the idea of like raising men who don't bicker about mosquitoes, 
If mosquitoes literally killed me, really? Also, if mosquitoes kill you, we don't want you. Also. We don't want you. What are we gonna do with you, huh? Bullets flying, as like, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. But just anyways, the believers. That's the group that does all. The, all the doing is done by the believers. So connect yourself to to your masjid, to learning your religion. When the Prophet and even learning the end of times. So I mean, the Prophet when he mentioned the famine that will happen on the earth at the time or before the Dajjal comes out and the third year in particular, the companion said, how will people eat? Like there's not a drop of rain on the planet. All vegetation is, uh, will not grow and all hooved animals except for a few will remain. So the companions immediately said, how will people eat Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, by making tasbih, tahmeed, takbir, tahmeed. And when you say that to, in that time period, nutrients will come into your blood. You will survive by saying, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah. How would you know that if you didn't read the hadith? Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, who lived yani, about 800 years ago, he says, this is the importance of teaching this material to your children and they teach it to their children so that whatever of your progeny or, or your ancestors is alive at the time, they know how to survive. How else would you know? How else would you guess that if I say these four words, I will get nutrients and that will be equivalent to eating? You wouldn't know. And that's why the Prophet tells us about these signs so that we know how to behave when that time comes. And every one of the victories and the great things that happen to the believers or, or to the Muslims will be at the hands of the believers. So make sure you raise your children and make sure that you're from that group. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to say, and before we do a run through the timeline, unless anyone has any questions, is that the minor signs, there are many. One of the scholars enumerated 400 signs, minor signs before the Day of Judgment. But the major are 10. The major are 10. There's no dispute about them. Some scholars said the Mahdi is one of the 10, which would make it 11, but that's not an accepted opinion. The major are 10, the minor are many. And the minor don't all have to be bad. One time, uh, I was doing a class on this, and a sister came up to me. She said, what is the matter with these Arabs? Why do they keep building these skyscrapers, and they know it's one of the signs of the Day of Judgment? Yeah, and it was like, it's, they're bringing it closer, which is one of the beautiful things we have in our religion. There's nothing you can do to bring for or push up or bring forward one of the signs as opposed to the Christian belief that they can do something that will make Jesus come faster. And Jesus is up in the heaven, hey, go, hey Allah, now. <laughs> this is, you can't change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. We don't have that. We can't have a bunch of guys sick and tired of what's going on. You know what? Forget this. We're not waiting for the Mahdi. One of you be the Mahdi. Allah bismillah. Who votes for, who votes for Abdullah? Khalas Abdullah, you're the Mahdi. <laughs> so we can't do that. So, they're not actually bringing forward the day, the, the day of judgment or anything like that. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned the, the barefoot, the naked barefoot shepherds that will, will compete in the construction of tall buildings. Scholars said naked and barefoot means recently they were poor. I saw a black and white photo of Dubai. It was insane. It was like some little busted up village. It's recent. But in no time, look at the changes. So when he said naked, barefoot, means they were recently poor and then they came on to a lot of wealth. And now, you know. So there is nothing that says this is bad. I know people who would not decorate their homes. I'll tell you look from the signs of the hour that people decorate their homes. It's not saying it's a bad thing. When the Prophet spoke this, the walls and homes were either made of solid stones or they were... Uh, يعني, mud walls, you know, palm stalks covered in mud. And you didn't, and, and if that was your home, you didn't have the idea of let me hammer a nail into this mud, and hang a poster or, or of calligraphy. They didn't have that. So the Prophet is talking about how towards the end of times people will decorate their homes. He didn't say it's a bad thing. They will can compete in the construction of tall buildings. It's not a bad thing. It's just how the world will look. That uh, um, commerce will be so plentiful 
that a man will bring his wife to help him at his place of work. And I used to see brothers, if they see a man and his, and his wife working in their own business, oh, look at this guy. He brings his wife to work with him. Type, if his wife went to work for another guy, you don't have a problem. If she works with her husband, you have a problem. What kind of mentality is this? At least with her husband, she can yell at her boss and make him do what she wants. Threaten him. She can't do it with the other guy. So it, it's not a bad thing. It's saying there was a time when the wife would stay, the man would go. There was so little commerce. And when he would get whatever he needed for the day, he would close the store and come back home. But now business will increase so much that instead of his wife just staying home with nothing to do, he tells her, I need your help. That's what the hadith is saying. It's not saying it's a bad thing. The hadith mentions that towards the end of time that there will be so much killing, much, so much so that a, a 50 women will have one qayyim. Qayyim hina, it means the, like the person who looks after. So is that haram? It's not haram. It's just something that's going to happen in that world. There's nothing bad about it. Unless you're that guy. Just kidding. So... <laughs> So, the, so not every sign means it's absolutely a bad thing and you have to uh, stay away from it. Naam? Yes, because of a lot of killing. Because of a lot of killing. All right. Taib, uh, is there anything before we move on to a brief description of the 10 signs, 10 major signs? Or anything, some, anything you want to say? or? Yes, sir. What is the story about uh, someone to claim to be the Mahdi in the cabinet? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay. Five. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, it's, it's going to take a little bit of our time, but I, I, I love this incident, right? So I don't mean it in that way. But basically, in 1979, it's known as the Fitna of Juhayman. And uh, the Saudi government was super secretive about this and didn't express it uh, or, or talk about it. But now they have like a documentary with reenactments and everything. But basically, there was, uh, and look at this story, basically. There are a lot of lessons in it. So uh, in, in, the 19, in 1979 is when it actually happened. A little before that, there was a young man and, and a young group of young men and for all intents and, uh, and purposes, they appeared to be righteous young men, religious and students of knowledge and everything. One of them, his name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he did have the, the pronounced forehead and the, the aqnal anfi, the aquiline nose with a bridge. Kida. So he actually had the name of the Mahdi and he kind of resembled the physical description of the Mahdi. And the shaitan had a crazy role to play in this. Yeah, crazy. So what happened was... Um, uh, like the shaitan gave a number of total random strangers the same exact dream so you're you're that guy now and a stranger that you've never seen before walks up to you and says hey I saw you in my dream last night that we were giving you the bay'ah at the Kaaba and you're the Mahdi what would you say? right? then a complete other stranger that you've never seen before and he doesn't know the first guy comes and tells you the same thing. You're like, well, oh, this is a strange day, right? But then a third guy who doesn't know the first two and doesn't know you tells you the same thing. And a fourth and a fifth. Well, I, I don't care who you are. After like 12, you'll be like, well, oh, I think I am. I always felt like a Mahdi. Huh? <laughs> so then they started, his friends started to, and Juhayman was the main ringleader and he, they were convinced they were convinced that they have the Mahdi amongst them. And they, in the Fajr Salah, s smuggled some uh, weapons into the Haram. And you know, every time you change, uh, like you break a rule, it makes it difficult for generations after. Now you can't just bring a dead body. Oh, it's a dead body. We're going to pray after the Salah. Now you have to have a tasrih and, uh, and you know, documents and all that. But they just brought a, a beer, B-I-E-R, which is the bed they carry the, 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 the dead body on. They just had a beer with them, and inside it was weapons, and they came in, and after the salah, everyone grabbed their weapons, they closed the doors. The imam slipped away, actually. Slipped away quickly. He realized what's going on, slipped away. And then they, he, the imam grabbed the microphone, and, and he started pontificating and talking about 
the problems and the ummah and the corruption and the leaders and all this and that and how corrupt the world was. This is 79, imagine. And if he lived today, he's talking about how corrupt everything was and all that. And I have here with me the Mahdi. And they put him between the Rukn and the Maqam. Exactly what the Hadith describes. People will pledge to him between the Rukn and the Maqam. And they put him there just like the Hadith. And before doing that, they did something else that I see is the crazy part, of, craziest part of the story. They know that the Mahdi flees Medina to go to Mecca. So they went to Medina. And they fled. From what? I don't know. And I always think that was, must have been one of the craziest car rides in history. Because it's like there's nobody behind you and you're like, yes, yeah, step on it. Step on it. Okay? And at some point they should have said, we're just reenacting the hadith. There's nobody really. We're not fleeing. But they're trying to make it match. And then they, uh, yeah, and they had snipers up on the, on the minarets of the, of the haram in Mecca. And it was, uh, how many days was it? I can't recall now. Was it two, three days or was it a week or something? And they kept the, the, the people in Umrah and everything. Everybody was trapped in there. And then even some legitimate scholars said, maybe he is the Mahdi. And then people went back and forth, back and forth. Then they said, okay, we'll send the army. And when they sent the army, the army said, this is you are. That's exactly what they said. Because the army said, oh, they, they knew the hadith. Remember what I told you last week? He, he seeks refuge at the Kaaba. Then an army is sent to destroy him. Then when they get to this open space, the earth swallows up the army. So in 1979, when they told the army, you go in to the haram, they said, oh. I uh, you want the earth to swallow me up? Are you just sitting here? Huh? So the army said no in the beginning until they, based, until they realized, okay, at, at some point it gets clearer and clearer and like it is just a bunch of guys that took over. And so the army went in and a firefight ensued. And then they went into the Juhayman and his people, including this Mahdi. Uh, and he wanna be. They went in down and so back then the, uh, Zamzam had these like underground areas, uh, the wells and everything, not the wells, and the water fountains and everything were down. So they all went down there and they smoked them out. They like burnt tires. And that's why when you, if you Google it, you will find pictures of these Shabab and they all have soot all over their face. They look strange, black soot everywhere. So then, but the, but Juhayman was captured alive and like 63 of them were captured alive. But the guy, you can find pictures of him, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the one who thought was their Mahdi, you can find pictures of him on Google. Of course, he's deceased in the photos, but you can see the bridge in the nose and the pronounced forehead. And there is a, a theory, it's not confirmed, that Juhayman shot him. Because when he realized that this is not what happens to the Mahdi, when people start to pledge to the Mahdi, the Ummah overnight recognizes him. And this, uh, I don't remember this hadith, well, I'm like smoke and stuff, and we're sitting here in the, in the, in the cellars and Musharraf. So well, like he basically realized he's not the Mahdi, might have verbalized it, Allah knows best. Some say the Juhayman shot him, others say he got shot in the, in the firefight. They took these 63 young men, and you can see videos of them, all black and white videos, all dirty faces, kidda. And then they, they executed 58 of them in different parts of the kingdom as a lesson also so people can visually see that. So they sent them to different parts of the kingdom. They had them executed. And uh, I don't know if a few of them were pardoned, pardoned or not. But basically that became known as the fitna of Juhayman. And right now there's some docu documentaries with some reenactments. So now be careful when you Google it now you will find the actor who played Juhayman in some of the images as you Google it and not the or original. So you have to kind of decipher and see which is which. But basically, finally now there's some, some coming out uh, about that. But before it was just so hush-hush, you had to investigate deep to find out. That's the, the fitna of Juhayman in more or less in brief. Allah ta'ala ala. Anyone else? All right, so we're not going to take long. So let's look at a quick run through the 10 major signs before the Day of Judgment. So we mentioned last week the three fitan 
trials that will be will have a huge effect and will affect people until the last one separates people into believers and hypocrites. Then the Mahdi obviously will come out during that time period. And after people pledge to the Mahdi, and the Prophet says, if you hear of him, pledge even if you have to crawl over snow. If you have to crawl over the snow, make sure you get to him. All right. And when uh, when that happens, the Prophet said he will rule for seven years. So another hadith mentions seven to nine years. He will rule and he will fill the earth with justice and he will distribute wealth. But the Dajjal uh, emerges during this time period. And before the Dajjal emerges, the Prophet mentioned three years. The year, the first year before the emergence of the Dajjal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the sky to withhold one third of its rain and the earth to withhold one third of, of its vegetation. In the second year, Allah will command the, the heavens or the sky to withhold half its rain and the earth half its vegetation. And then in the third year, the Prophet says, Allah will command the sky, the sky or the heaven, the clouds, yani, to withhold all of its rain, the Prophet says, and it will not rain a single drop on earth and the and the vegetation will not grow, not a single plant will grow all over the earth and all vegetation will die and all hoofed animals will die except for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Then the Mahdi emerges when there is this famine and starvation and, and sorry, not the Mahdi, the Dajjal. Initially, he tells people he claims to be a prophet and then he tells people that I am your Lord, the one who created you. And then the Prophet said, describes him a lot, and we, as we said last year, uh, last uh, week, even said Ibn Qatan is the one who looks like him. He's got the same figure and everything. He is a human being. He has two eyes, not one. He is not a cyclops. Human beings have two eyes in their head. And if one of them is non-functional, you say you have one eye. It doesn't mean you're a cyclops. Yeah, you've seen that video on, on YouTube. This Turkish baby was born and has one eye henna. And the question is, is, they put this uh -huh, uh, nasheed in the background and they wrote, is this the Dajjal? <laughs> but it's bad enough for these two parents that their baby was born with one eye and now they have to find a video of him on YouTube being uh, accused of being the Dajjal. So the Dajjal has two eyes, one of them being bad and he has curly hair and he has as white as complexion and he is of the, towards the shorter end of being height, uh, of his height but not... He's like not short, short, but he's not tall either. And then he travels the earth. He, the Prophet said when he first emerges, the first day will be the length of a year. How many hours are in a year? That's how many hours and the length of that day. Some scholars said it, because it's a very difficult day, it will seem like a long day, like a year. Others said no, it will be exactly as long as a year as long. Because the companions, their first question was, how will we pray? And he said, you will estimate it. You know, you pray Fajr and then after six or seven hours there's Dhuhr. You will wait six, seven hours, then you pray Dhuhr, then you'll pray Asr. It's like that. Then uh, the second day will be as long as a month. And then the, second, the third day will be as long as a week. And then the fourth day will be as long as the rest of your days. And the scholars say it gets shorter because the falsehood by its nature is that it gets weaker. So he's getting weaker and weaker. He will travel the earth in 40 days and he, there will not be a village except that, or city except that he will enter that city except Mecca and Medina. He cannot enter the two. He cannot enter the city of Mecca and Medina. He, cannot, he can enter the other cities but he cannot enter Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So he can enter the city but not Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Then the Prophet says he will come to Medina and he will stand at the top of one of the mountains and he will point to his followers and he will say, do you see that palace? That, that, sorry, do you see that white palace? That is the Masjid of Ahmad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's amazing that when the Prophet spoke this, his Masjid was brown and earth tone colors. And how would he know that his Masjid is going to become white? Look at satellite images of the Masjid al Nabawi now. And it's white. And from, from space, it's white. And the Prophet said he will say, do you see that white palace? That is the Masjid of Ahmad. And because he can't enter Medina, then there will be three tremors and every hypocrite, male or female, will leave Medina and they will join the army of the Dajjal. The Prophet said, if you hear of him, run away. Don't do anything else. Run away. You can't kill him because you already know 
only Isa alayhi salam can kill him. All right? You can't convince him to change his mind because you took a class on persuasion, مثلا. <laughs> it's like as useless as trying to convince your Qareen, your non-Muslim jinn that's with you the whole time. It's as useless as trying to convince him to become Muslim. And you sit in the room by yourself. Ya <laughs> We pray together. It's useless. So what happens? Uh, the Prophet said, if you hear of him, run. And as I mentioned last week, people will tie their family members to their home so they don't go and join the Dajjal. The Prophet ﷺ said, a man will, will hear of the Dajjal and he will be confident in his iman. I'm like, I, there's no way I'm going to believe a man is Allah. And he will go there and he'll be convinced and he will follow him. That's why he said, run away. You don't know. Believers will follow, non-believers will follow him. And he will produce things. He will, he will first of all, he will command uh, an, an area of the, uh, of the earth, yani a land. And every precious gem, metal, underground will come up. The Prophet ﷺ said, like a swarm of bees, it will follow him. He will command the terrain, it will rain instantly. Vegetation will grow instantly. And the, the animals will eat from it and their others will fill instantly. And so the people of the village will believe in him. Then he'll go to another village and he'll show them the rivers and the rain and all that and they will refuse to believe in him. And he will leave them in a more difficult situation, more drought, more famine. Then the Prophet ﷺ said he will come with a river of fire and a river of water at a time when you need water. And he will say, you know, if you believe with me, in me you can drink from this water. If you don't believe in me, this fire. And the Prophet ﷺ says, his advice to us, he said, close your eyes and drink from the fire. It will be water. It looks like fire. The scholar said, why did he say close your eyes? Because you can't put your face in fire as you're staring at it. Close your eyes so you don't see it and put your face in that. It will be actual cool water. And those are the believers. And then, of course, we're moving quickly. Then he gets aggressive and he First, he's not killing anyone. He is just testing people and the shayateen will assist him. By the way, in the story of the Dajjal, you don't hear about the Illuminati or anything else. Okay? So, that they, oh, they will pave the way. What paved the way? Do you see paved the way in this story? So, the shayateen will assist him. So, he will tell a person, if I bring your mother and father back to life, will you believe that I'm your Lord? And the man says, if he could do that, I'll believe. And then two shayateen, the hadith says, will take the form of his parents. So you will see your mother who died 25 years ago. Exactly her, in the flesh, and same sound. And she'll say, my son, listen, I've, I've died. I know where I'm from. I've been there. He is your Lord. Believe in him. And the person will believe in him. And then he cut. Then there's the incident of the, one of the greatest martyrs in the sight of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ describes a young man brimming with youth. And he will come and the people of the Dajjal will capture him. They say, do you believe that the Dajjal is our Lord? He will say, no. So they will take him to the Dajjal. And the Dajjal will say, do you believe that I'm your Lord? He said, he will say, no. So then he will cut him in half. And he will cut him in two separate halves and walk between the two halves. Then he will call him back to life. So he will come back together and come back to life. And then the hadith describes that he will be smiling. And he'll say, now I am even more sure that you are the Dajjal. And the scholars say, how does he know? How is he even more sure? Because he knew the hadith. That's why it's important to understand this. He's like, oh my God, I heard about this at Friday Night Lights. And I didn't know I was the guy. That, I am that guy. That's why he smiles like, oh, I read about myself. So then the Dajjal now tries to to kill him, tries to cut his neck, but it will become of brass. Now, there's something interesting here. And so he can't cut his neck. The Dajjal can't cut his neck. This is very embarrassing for him because his believers think he is Allah. He is God who created this guy. Now he can't kill him. Very embarrassing. But what's interesting, I always think about why, why is it that his knife just wouldn't work? Why does his neck change to brass? Because that's visible. Everyone can see that his neck changed to an actual metal. And now nothing works. So now this is embarrassing for the Dajjal. So he takes him and throws him into a fire. But the Prophet said he will actually be throwing him into a Jannah. And he will be of the greatest martyrs in the sight of Allah. So now 
The Dajjal has an army, so the Mahdi, even though he knows he cannot kill the Dajjal, he prepares an army to resist the Dajjal. And that's why I always say there's a lesson in that. The Mahdi knows he can't kill the Dajjal, but he still does his part, you know? So same thing for us. We don't sit and wait for the Mahdi. That's paralyzing. You sit and wait for the Mahdi, he's gonna do the work. No. You do your work. Even if it's something the Mahdi can do, you do your part, you resist. So the Mahdi puts together an army and there will be a battle between the believers and the forces of the Dajjal. And the battle will be so severe that if a bird flies over the battlefield from the heat and from all the projectiles, it would drop dead. And one third of the army will be martyred. And the Prophet said they, they will be of the greatest martyrs in the sight of Allah. And one third of the army will uh, run away. And the hadith says Allah will never forgive them. And one third lives to fight the next day. So the next day they fight and they break into that. Martyrs, those who run away, those who remain. You see, the group is getting cleaner and cleaner also. Then on the fourth Fajr, so like, uh, or maybe it's the third day of battle. By the way, how much, I mean, have, have we done an hour yet? When it, uh, close, huh? Five. Well, let me know, inshallah. And try to finish all. So basically what happens, then, uh, like I described earlier, they make the iqamah, they're about to pray, pray Fajr, and then they see the sky open up. And the Prophet describes they will see Isa salam descending with a hand on the wing of each angel. He's with two angels, hand on this wing, hand on this wing, and he's descending. The Prophet describes his hair. And every time he describes him, he describes his hair. And when he describes the Dajjal, he describes his hair. So that people don't be confused between Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, and Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal. This guy has curly hair. This guy has long, soft hair. It's as if he just came out of a shower, basically, or a bath, where your hair is still limp and wet. Always describe his hair like that, long and limp. And then even describe the color of the garment he's wearing, lightly yellow, and a light yellow on it, and he comes down like this. When he descends down, imagine seeing that. Oh, amazing, huh? seeing two angels with their own eyes and seeing Isa alayhi salam. So when he lands, the believers, they leave the prayer lines and they rush to him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, he will wipe on people's faces and tell them their, their place in Al-Jannah. Wipe on your face, tell them your place in Al-Jannah. Wipe on your face. And I always say, imagine missing that Fajr. <laughs> you come back, your roommate is still sleeping. He's like, hey, you missed Fajr. He's like, yeah, I'll make it up. Like, nah, habibi, you we saw angels, ya akhi. Isa told us our place in Al-Jannah. So then Al-Mahdi would say, Taqaddam ya ruh Allah, and he will push him like from this shoulder here. He'll, tell the, he'll say, the prayer was, the Iqamah was made for you. And the scholars say a number of things. Number one, Isa alayhi salam prays behind the Mahdi to indicate, I am not coming as a prophet, but I has come, I'm coming as a follower of your prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the scholars said something interesting, that Isa alayhi salam is a prophet and the Sahabi. Yes, he qualifies. Sahabi is someone who met the Prophet ﷺ while he was alive. He met him during the Isra and Mi'raj journey and believed in him. And when the Prophet ﷺ died, he was still a believer in him. So he's a Sahabi. And then someone asked me once, do the people who saw Isa become Tabi'een? No, they don't. They don't become Tabi'een. So uh, that, that's one. Two, to, to, because the scholar said, Al Mahdi has the Quran and Isa السلام, has the Injil and which one is superior? No doubt. So he prays behind the Mahdi then we don't hear anything else about the Mahdi. But he comes as a warrior. Not turn the other cheek or all this other stuff. He comes as a warrior. Prophet said he can kill the Dajjal just by looking at him. He said if he looks at him if he looks at him, he will dissolve just like salt dissolves in water. So he can kill him just by looking at him, but he doesn't kill him by looking at him. He takes a spear and he chases him. Oh man, there's so many interesting things. Like where Isa salam comes down is a very interesting story. Comes down near, should we go into this? There's so little time. He comes down near the white minaret in the eastern side of Damascus. In the year 741 after the Hijrah, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, the Christians in Damascus, with no right, destroyed a minaret for the masjid in Damascus. 
So the ruler, as a punishment, made them rebuild it from their own money. So they rebuilt it from a white stone or white marble. And Ibn Kathir and others who were alive, when they saw that, they're like, wow, a white minaret on the eastern side of Damascus? Google white minaret, you'll see it today. It's still standing. So it's so, the irony is beautiful. Like Isa alayhi salam, that the Christians claim to follow, will come down on the side of the Muslims at the site that you paid for from your own pocket. <laughs> it's so in your face, I don't know. Yani, so basically, then, uh, but let's skip, let's go to where Isa alayhi salam takes a spear and he chases the Dajjal. And he catches up to him near the eastern door of Lud in Palestine. And then he stabs him with the spear and he raises the spear and he shows the blood to everybody. Why? Because if he just looks at him until he dissolves, his followers are going to say, nonsense. Oh, our Lord left the worldly big body and he ascended and went back to the heaven, right? But if they see blood, they're going to say, oh, that wasn't God. God can't be killed by a spear. And they will realize that when he lifts that blood up in the spear, they will scatter everywhere. The army of the Dajjal scatters everywhere. And that's when the Muslims go after them and they finish them off. And then the people, then the hadith says, فَبَيْنَمَاهُمْ كَذَلِكَ While they're in that situation, Allah announces to them that I have let loose servants of mine that nobody can withstand. Uh, because Isa alayhi salam, he comes as a warrior. Before killing the Dajjal, he kills with his breath. He comes as a warrior, and it's the next day of battle, right? So when the battle starts, from his breath, everything until the horizon, every soldier until the horizon dies. You just imagine like dominoes. Like he looks this way, and just like dominoes. Until as far as his eye can see, people drop. Imagine a soldier like that in your army. You know, he's blowing this way, blowing this way. They're getting close from this side. You're like, uh, Isa, Zakir just look this way. He looks this way, tuk, 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 people drop. So look at the power that he has here. Then he kills the Dajjal. But even though he could kill people with his breath until the horizon, Allah tells him nobody can handle them. Which is beautiful because it's, it's still saying he's not God, he's not divine. Because even though he can kill people in this magnificent way, a few moments later or a little while later, he's told nobody can handle them. Which indicates he's not divine. Because now you have to hide. So he takes the few believers who are with him and they go hide into the Mount of At-Tur. The scholar said, how will the Mount of At-Tur fit everybody? Two opinions. One says Allah will make it fit everyone. The second opinion says it might be another mountain at that time that is called At-Tur and they will hide there. Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come out. They will come out and they will break through the physical barrier. Not a figurative barrier. You all read Surah Al-Kahf. Every Friday, is that barrier actual or physical? Yani, if, uh, figurative. It, it's a f is it physical or figurative? If you tell me it's figurative, but why is Allah describing the materials and the process of building something figurative? Ituni zubar al hadid. Zubar yani clumps kida of iron. So we got iron, and then ufrig alayhi qitara, which is mo uh, which is copper which people used to mix the two because copper oxidizes, I mean, and it saves the iron from rusting. And type, what does copper mean figuratively? What is qalam fukhuf, blow? What is that? What is blowing figuratively? What is iron, chunks of iron figuratively? What is this said figuratively? It's an actual barrier. They break through and they come out angry because you're the ones who trapped us. So they begin to kill everybody on earth. I'm going to go super fast now. Isa alayhi salam and the believers, they wait until they're hungry and they're poor. The Prophet says, until the head of an ox to one of them is more beloved to them than a thousand dinars for one of you. That's how poor they are. Then finally, and they're just making dua, making dua to Allah. That's all they can do. And even though Ya'juj and Ma'juj scour the earth, they'll never find them. And the scholars said, just like you believed in Ya'juj and Ma'juj without being able to see them, your reward is that they will not be able to see you. So then they, a young man volunteers to go see what's going on, if they're gone or not. And they all bid him farewell. They expect him to die. And he goes out and yet Juj and Majuj are dead. 
everywhere. Because when they were making dua, Allah sent a nagaf, these small worms that enter into their bodies and they go into their brain. فيموتوا, uh, the Prophet said, they die the death of one man. Yani when you have billions of people or millions of people, everyone has a different immune system. So today this guy, his throat itches and he coughs. Tomorrow he dies. Then tomorrow the next guy starts, <clears throat> I think I'm coming down with something, then he dies. But the Prophet said, they all die the death of one man. So these millions, how does one man die? Like this? All these millions die the same instant. All of them just drop, shoo, like that. So he goes out and finds all the dead bodies. Then he lets Isa and the believers, alayhi salam and the believers know that they're all dead. Then they come out and then, but there are dead bodies everywhere and the whole world reeks. So they make dua to Allah Azjil again. And the Prophet says Allah will send birds that have necks like camels, long necks. And they will carry the bodies of Yajuj and Majuj to where Allah, wherever Allah decrees. Others, other scholars said, or narrations mentioned, they will throw them out in the ocean. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a thick heavy rain that will clean, the cleanse the earth. فَتُصْبِحُ كَالزَّلَفَةِ So it looks like a mirror shining and bright and it will be said to the earth, Ruddi or um, uh, yeah, uh, it will be said, return your thamara, thamarataki, wa ruddi barakataki. Yani return your fruit and return your original blessings. And the Prophet described that a group of men can eat one pomegranate and they can even get shelter under its skin. That one cow will produce enough milk for the entire village and one sheep for the whole family. And this is true peace on earth. There is not a single liar, not a disbeliever. Isa alayhi salam broke the cross symbolically and he killed the pig sim symbolically. Some scholars said not a single pig will remain on earth. Finally, you don't have to say, oh, is it put on the same grill as pork? None of that stuff, okay? Others said symbolically he will kill the pig and uh, the people will only see true dreams and a child will put its hand in the burrow of the snake and it will not bite him and predatory animals will not uh, attack the cows and the sheep. It's just the best time to ever be alive. And the Prophet said a sajda will be better than the whole world and everything in it. And you just imagine that. You make sujood, you're not in a rush to get out of it, to run to the market or to do this. Just that's it. Only the best of people are alive. And then Isa alayhi salam remains for a number of years and he makes hajj and he visits the Prophet salam and he gives him salam and the Prophet salam responds to salam. Then he is... Uh, some scholars said he will probably get married. We don't know. And it's not acceptable to make dua <laughs> to be his wife. <laughs> scholars actually mention that. that because it's, people say, can I ask Allah to be the wife of Isa when he returns? They said it's not from the adab of dua to ask it. Ya Allah, I want an orange house in the Jannah. But if you get a purple one, you're like, I don't want it. It's not good adab. So he will be buried this the scholars had this, uh, yeah, let's call it a theory or an idea for a long time. There's no clear evidence for it. But they believe that he will be buried possibly with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr and Umar. Because there's a space for one body there. And they said, most likely people will think, let's bury him with the Prophet Sallallahu Allah Azza wa knows best. And then, so when he dies, the Muslims will pray over him and bury him. Then we've got generations. And we start to see evil come again and wickedness come again and the shaitan's influence rise up again and killing and lying and cheating. There's, see, people forget the timeline. There's going to be yeah, I mean, the timeline. There are generations and the beast emerges and marks people and then generations come and then the smoke and then... So when Islam then disappears and there's no... The Quran, there's not a mushaf on earth. It will be lifted. All this is very end of times. The Kaaba will be destroyed. Very end of times. Prophet said, "Yukharibu al-Kaaba the swaykatayni min al-Habasha." A man by the name of the swaykatayn, by the description of having two bow legs, and the Prophet described him with small ears and physically de a deformed body, and he will destroy the Kaaba. The Prophet says, "Ka'ani bihi." It's as if I'm looking at him right now. Hajaran hajaran. He's taking it apart, stone by stone, brick by brick. Nobody stops him. Yes, because nobody knows what the Kaaba is. This is very end of times. No one has a clue. So he destroys the Kaaba. Nobody stops him. 
And Allah doesn't stop him because what's the use of stopping him? Allah stopped Abra and his elephants because if they destroyed the Kaaba, they would have threatened its existence. They would have switched it to the one in Yemen. But here, Allah's not going to protect the Kaaba. There's no need for it. Nobody knows what it is. This is very end of time. So sometimes people get confused. That's because they don't pay attention to the timeline. But basically, uh, after that, we've got three signs so far. The Dajjal, Isa, Ya'juj, and Ma'jud. These three happen in order. There's no dispute about the order. You saw how this, they were attached to each other, this, right? That's why when somebody says Ya'juj and Ma'jud are out, La Habib. Unless we're Ya'juj and Ma'jud, they're not out, okay? Um, then there will be a landslide, no detail here. A landslide in the east, a landslide in the west, and a landslide in the Arabian Peninsula. We all know what a landslide is. is are we talking about a little sinkhole in a, in a neighborhood in Guatemala? No, it's so major that everybody recognizes it because one of the major signs. So that now we're up to six landslide, east, west, Arabian Peninsula, and the first three. Then the sun rises from the west that we talked about and the beast that, that emerges from the earth. And the Prophet said, whichever one comes first, the other one will come right after. Then the smoke. And the smoke is the actual physical thick, heavy smoke that fills everything. The roads, every room, every house, everywhere. And, and when you inhale the smoke, the believer gets the sniffles. But the disbeliever becomes blackened and he becomes bloated. And so it will label them like that. And then after that is the great fire that gathers all the people to the land of resurrection. So it's a fire that's bringing people. Some scholars say from all around the earth. Others say just from like, I don't know, maybe like, like the Middle East parts of Asia will be pushing people. It's like, imagine it like lava almost. It's traveling with people. Prophet said, تَقِيلُوا حَيْثُ قَالُوا yani Wherever they stop, to take a nap, the fire stops moving. When they spend the night, the fire stops moving. When they get up next day and start moving, it moves with them. What if a guy says, I notice when we stop, it stops. I'm not going anywhere. That's what you're thinking of, Kaleem, right? Prophet said, Man anha akalatu. Whoever stays behind it eats him up, consumes him. So you got to keep moving. And then until we get to the horn bl being blown into, and the Prophet, of course, many hadith describing. What happens when the angel blows into the horn? First one, everyone on earth dies. And then the angels, their soul is taken. And then the angel of death. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one anywhere in the universe. And he says, To whom is the dominion today? To whom is the dominion today? And then he answers himself by himself subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's nobody else. Then he brings the angel of death back to life. Then the angels back to life. Then the horn is blown into the second time and people are standing. It's called Yom Al-Qiyamah because people are standing and they're looking around completely back to, to life, conscious, this is me, my same body, and they're standing there for, waiting for the judgment to begin. That part is another story, another description. But... For the most part, these are the major signs before the Day of Judgment. Um, the minor signs are many. Some of them have happened. Some are happening. Some are going to happen. But uh, are, the, are we at the end of times? One more time. We said if we look at where we are in the age of the earth, we're towards the end of the age of the earth. Um, the description of our world today, is it the description of the world where all these things happen? No, not at this moment. Could it change within a few years? Absolutely. Anything major, even what's happening in Palestine now can be part of the beginning of that world where the Mahdi comes out or where leading to the Khilafah that will happen and then the civil war, then the Mahdi, all these things. But the point is, these are all in the, the, the unseen. So we can just look at what's going on and we can say this is possible, this is plausible. But we can't fill in the blanks as we please. And we, you know, all the other games that are played online. We'll stop here, inshallah. I apologize for going so long. But thank you for listening attentively and being patient. So Allahumma baraka ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.